Hello and good morning. How are all my favorite people doing today? Just a few days ago, I went and got a full body deep tissue massage. Oh my god. I can't believe I've waited 26 years for something like that. It was the greatest 50 minutes in my entire life. I never thought I'd enjoy a 60 year old woman's hands as much as I did. Shout out Lisa. It might be crazy, but honestly, that whole experience had me thinking of getting a masseuse license myself. Doing house calls on my days off from my other job, work when and where I'd like. I don't know, could be cool. Or I could be a professional cuddler. Meh, I'm probably just lonely. Today, I bring you the tale of two hermits. My name is Eli, and this is murder in the morning. My sources for today come from artforjustice.org, France Today, Britannica, Medieval Magic, and a few other sites that I'll, I'll put down below. Our story takes place during the 1570s in the small town of Dole, D-O-L-E, in France, located in the Franche County region, and I did look up the pronunciation on that. It remains a beautiful and highly untouched area of the country. According to France Today, whatever you love about France, you'll find in this glorious area in abundance. Lush countryside splashed with areas of dense forest, the mountains of Jura, or Jura, and southern regions for summer and winter sports, lakes and rivers for cruising holidays and recreation, and a rich history that's guaranteed to stir the imagination through heritage towns and cultural sites. Landlocked between Burgundy to the west and Switzerland to the east, Franche Comte has seen rulers come and go across the centuries. From the Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Empire, to the Habsburgs and the Kings of France. And the name? It's a legacy of the time when the area was an independent, quote, free country or county. Miraculously undamaged by two world wars, the town has retained its beautiful Renaissance buildings, constructed in a fetching combination of, of local stone in shades of pale blue and cream. The old town beneath the citadel is full of historic buildings enchanting courtyards, and hidden gardens. The area also shares two of the largest regional parks in France. I don't even want to try to pronounce these. Um, the Parc Naturel Régional de Bayouns de Vogues to the north, and another one along its eastern border with Switzerland. As for the town of Dole specifically, developed around a 12th century chateau on a Roman road, Dole was the capital of Comte, first under Burgundian, Burgundian, yeah, and then under Habsburg rule. But in 1674, the town was conquered by Louis the 14th, annexed to France, and lost its status. Sam Kemp of the UK Far Out magazine wrote, quote, Dole is picture perfect right down to the last dragonfly. The narrow streets of this tiny town in France are filled with cafes, timber-framed houses, and shops bursting with regional cheeses. There's the sun-dappled convent with its many blossoms, the ancient spring concealed beneath the old bridge, and Le Pla à Fleur, where a bronze sculpture looks out towards the collegiate church of Notre Dame and the vineyards beyond." End quote. Although considered one of the most elegant and idyllic towns in this rural area, Dole has a dark and unnatural history. Keep in mind that throughout this story, the people of this era accepted the idea of magic, the devil, all things evil, a belief that had been growing for centuries, and a lot of people say it would peak during the Middle Ages. Sometime during the early to mid-1570s, Children started disappearing in this quaint town of Dole. Unlike other mysterious vanishings, the children weren't missing for long. The first child to be found was a young girl aged 10 to 12. 
she had been killed and her flesh torn away before being dumped in a vineyard just outside town. As soon as her body was recovered, rumors began to swirl. The townspeople believed that if it were any normal animal, any animal of this world, they would have eaten her the best they could. However, she was only ripped apart and left on, dis left on display. And so, the whisper of a werewolf flowed through the streets of Dole. In a world where dark magic reigns and the devil could possibly knock on your door any day, the thought of a shape-shifting werewolf wasn't that far off. Eight days later, their wild theories were only garnished. Just before sundown, near the outskirts of town, a few villagers came across a large, dog-wolf-looking creature hovering over the body of a dead child. As they approached, the witnesses claimed that the creature was feasting on this tiny frame. Before they could reach the creature, it ran off into the forest, leaving an utterly terrible scene behind. The body was that of a young girl, roughly the same age as the first. Her throat had been gouged and slashed, and her abdomen ripped open. Quote, a week later, a ten-year-old boy was killed while walking through a vineyard. Like the first child, the boy was strangled, the flesh torn from his arms. But unlike the first victim, the boy was found with both of his legs missing. Then, only a week later, according to Medium.com, a group of men were headed home after a long day on the job. Already exhausted, they wanted nothing more than to make it home peacefully. One man pointed to the sky and drew attention to the full moon, so the rest of the men quickened their pace. Any one of the time knew that werewolves would come out under that glistening full moon, and even these men with their calloused hands and puffed up chests were afraid of any four-legged beast that may lurk in the dark. But before they could entertain any of their fears, a low growl and a rustling nearby stopped the men dead in their tracks raising the hairs on the backs of their necks and stuttering their breaths to quick snaps of icy gasps. In a vineyard that brushes the side of a long road illuminated by the bright moon with the frozen air, the werewolf of Dole is ripping into a small animal. The men are afraid, but determined to run this werewolf off. They gulp and look each other in the eyes before they bravely step off the road and into the shadows of the vineyard. Strength in numbers, they think. With rising voices and fists, the men grow bold and run toward danger, but what they find will stunt their courage and leave them horrified. The men abruptly find themselves face to face with a gruesome discovery, but it was not a werewolf the men had heard snarling and growling. It was a local hermit. Worse, that was not a small animal that the men thought they had seen. It was the body of a young child with blood dripping and flesh hanging in hunks off of their body. This hermit in question, Gilles Garnier, and that's spelled G-I-L-L-E-S. And again, I did look up that pronunciation because I thought it was Guillez, but it's Gilles, Gilles. According to Far Out, born in nearby Lyon, Gilles Garnier had always been regarded as something of a foreigner. A strange and reclusive character, he lived in the forest north of Dole with his wife and child. Shortly after he married Apollonia, eastern France experienced an incredibly harsh winter. Without livestock or land of his own, Garnier struggled to provide for his family and was forced to wander the fields scavenging for food. Local farmers knew his face well, as it was one they'd seen growing thin and wild as the months wore on. It was at the height of this desperation that Garnier was approached by the devil. During his subsequent trial, this visit from the devil is further explained. According to Astonishing Legends, surprisingly, Garnier confessed. The story of how he became a, quote, werewolf, might be a little different from the ones that we are used to or have heard before. Garnier claimed that one night, a demon visited, visited him in his house and gave him a special ointment that would transform him into a wolf. 
Garnier accepted the strange gift from this stranger demon because he was starving, poor, and desperate for anything. Growing older and without stable employment, he found it harder and harder and harder to provide enough food for himself, his wife, and his child. However, when he applied the ointment and transformed into a werewolf, he, quote, lost his faculties and could not control his rage or hunger. He confessed to killing two girls and two boys and eating their flesh. He even claimed he brought some of their remains home with him to feed his wife. Now, there are, are othering, othering, differing um, accounts of whether or not the wife would eat these or take part in the cannibalistic nature of his werewol werewolfism. But who knows? Desperate times, man. Some claim that these confessions from him were to stop the torture being enacted upon him. But other tellings of the tale say the man willingly confessed to his reported crimes. Garnier was found guilty of both witchcraft since he utilized this magic ointment and lycanthropy, the act of becoming a werewolf. The court, upon hearing his confession, sentenced him to be burned at the stake. And on January 18th of 1573, he and his wife were dragged through the streets and burned at the stake for their crimes. The origins of lycanthropy or zoanthropy, which is becoming any animal, have a long and complex history. Today, it's widely considered more of a psychiatric syndrome, apparently. According to Britannica, quote, lycanthropy from Greek lykos meaning wolf and anthropo anthropos meaning man is a mental disorder in which the patient believes that they are a wolf or some other non-human animal. Undoubtedly stimulated by the once widespread superstition that Lycanthropy is a supernatural condition in which men assume the physical form of werewolves or other animals. The delusion has been most likely to occur among people who believe in reincarnation and the transmigration of souls. Usually a person is deemed to take the form of the most dangerous beast of their region. The wolf or bear in Europe and northern Asia, the hyena or leopard in Africa, the tiger in India, China, Japan, and other parts of Asia, but plenty of other animals are mentioned in many other cultures. Both superstition and psychiatric disorders are linked with belief in animal guardian spirits, vampires, witches, werewolves, and totemism. Does anybody else find it weird that, well, I guess we might be the only ones, but I doubt it, that they had us make totem poles in elementary school? The folklore, fairy tales, and legends of many nations and peoples show evidence of lycanthropic belief. Lycanthropic belief. Basically, the OG furries. No? It is quite interesting, though, that the animals differ so much from culture to culture, country to country, around the world. Has anybody ever read Spirit Bear? I'm just having flashbacks now to fifth grade. But that, my friends is the tale of two hermits. I know I said I was going to step away from this era in general during the last episode. Psych, bitch. I do hope you enjoyed the old-timey tale. And as always, send in any recommendations you may have. And a big, big, big thank you to everyone listening in today. Stick around after the jingles for a bonus story. Okie dokie. Bye-bye. Love you. Welcome to the lowbrow half of the uh, episode today. If you missed last week's, I showcased a few stories from the Art for Justice website, and I couldn't help but feel pulled, not obligated, to shed some more light on, on these individuals. This first story comes from Rene Angel, Angel, I'm sorry, Ortiz. Rene Ortiz has always maintained that he is innocent of a murder for which he is serving a sentence of life without parole in Pennsylvania. 
The following is his account of events that led to his wrongful conviction. This synopsis is written by Jerry Givnish, Art for Justice board member, founder, and past executive director of the Painted Bride Art Center. Jerry was a volunteer art teacher at Greaterford Prison from 1998 to 2006 when Renee was a participant in the arts workshops. Jerry has supported Renee's fight for justice for many years. On October 5, 1990, Harry Krantz and his girlfriend, Dawn Holmes, were riding around in the North Philly area looking for coke. They were hailed by several young Latino males who were selling drugs. While the sale was in progress, one of them decided to rob Harry Krantz. Reaching into the car to grab money and drugs, he stabbed Krantz with an ice pick. Harry would go on to die a week later in the hospital while Don Holmes survived and testified at the trial. About one week after Harry died, Hector Flores, a 15-year-old in the company of his mother, went to the police with a confession. He said that he was accompanied during the crime by a person named, quote, Spade, who wielded the ice pick and stabbed the victim. Since Rene Ortiz was known by the street name Spade, he was eventually picked up and questioned by the police. On October 23rd, Sergeant John Reckner led a 10-hour interrogation during which Renee's right hand was cuffed to a chair and he was denied food. Rene Ortiz did not give Officer Reckner a confession. Rene says that, that Reckner had him sign several blank sheets of paper on a clipboard, promising Rene that he would be released after he signed those papers. So he did. After Rene signed the blank papers, Officer Reckner left the room. He returned about an hour later with a confession, which Rene had not given, typed above his signature. Rene says that he was then unfastened from the chair and refastened with handcuffs on both of his hands. He was put into a cell to await trial, which would take place six months later. The false confession, which Rene did not write, would become the basis of the prosecution's case against him. From May 17th to June 4th, 1991, four young Latino men were tried together for the murder of Harry Krantz. Rene was represented by Charles Maracci, a court-appointed lawyer. Officer Reckner's version of the crime, which was written by somebody other than Rene and placed above his signature, was read in the courtroom and was allowed to become part of the evidence. Reckner testified that the interrogation lasted only two hours and that Rene was told that he was free to leave at any time, even though he was handcuffed. Rene himself was not called to testify. Therefore, the jury never heard his account of any of the events. All four of the defendants were found guilty and sentenced to life without parole. In his most recent PCRA, which stands for P -p 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 Post Conviction Risk Assessment, Rene Ortiz stated that his confession was falsified, that it was a crime narrative written by the police after he'd signed a blank piece of paper. This PCRA was dismissed in September of 2019 as untimely and without merit by Judge Janice Brinkley. Judge Brinkley was to issue details of her reasons for dismissal, like why she did it, by January 2020. That document, as of July of 2020, was never issued, or at least I couldn't find it. This evidence goes to the heart of Renee's falsified confession. The homicide unit that handled Renee's case in 1990 is the very same unit that led to the later exonerations of Anthony Wright, Sean Thomas, and Willie Vesey. The tactics of this police in this homicide unit, authoring a crime narrative and coercing its signing after lengthy, unrecorded interrogations, were used to wrongly convict other individuals. Mr. Ortiz will appeal this dismissal, arguing with the history of the homicide unit's misconduct established that police misconduct produced the confession, end quote. As of today, sadly, it does look like he still remains behind bars, but I pray that in further PCRAs, I don't pray, I hope that in further PCRAs, uh, the judges are more lenient because he has merit and it's never untimely. It just hurts your soul. Here, how about a happy ending? This is the story of Eddie Ramirez. His statement begins, quote, While most people spend their 20s discovering themselves and settling on plans for the future, I have been in prison battling 
to overcome a wrongful conviction. Throughout this entire ordeal, I have maintained my innocence and conducted myself with dignity and patience while the slow wheels of, in parentheses, in justice turn. I am now in my mid-thirties, and with the support of my wonderful family and friends, I am closer than ever to my freedom. As a poet and artist, I draw on my memories of the past, point of view in the present, and my dreams for the future. It is a constant communication with time and space, interpreted in a language that can be described as the, quote, calm in the chaos. A formal vandal of the graffiti scene, I have always attempted to create art for one purpose, to claim my existence. I am a son, a brother, an uncle, and a loving friend. Those who know me know me well, and I am also a fighter who refuses to live any other way than out loud. Let my art speak to you, and you will hear my voice. End quote. And good news, he was exonerated just last fall. Woo! Edward Ramirez exonerated on November 30th, 2023. After enduring 27 years of incarceration in Pennsylvania for a crime he did not commit, he is finally free. There was no physical evidence that connected Eddie to the crime. The DNA found at the scene of the crime was not Eddie's. Eddie's constitutional rights were violated because the prosecution withheld from the defense multiple pieces of evidence that would have benefited Eddie's case and his entire defense. Ramirez steadfastly fought against the injustice he was experiencing and with the support of his family and friends who stood by him throughout his struggle during the past 27 years, Eddie Ramirez has won the freedom that was stolen from him in 1996. The court vacated Eddie's sentence, and the Philadelphia DA declined to retry the case. Eddie is exonerated. End quote. It almost brings joys of tear to your eye. Joys of tear. It almost brings tears of joy to your eyes, but then I remember the people who put them there, knowing damn well what they did, will never suffer the same fate. It will forever be unfair in that regard, and he will never get that time back. The Art for Justice website, quote, calls for citizens, pol pol policy makers, policy makers, professionals, and employees in the criminal justice system to acknowledge and address systematic flaws such as the death penalty, solitary confinement, life without parole, wrongful convictions, cash bail, incarceration of individuals with mental illnesses, lack of access to quality legal representation, and prosecutorial misconduct. Unjust and inequitable laws, policies, and practices must be changed to achieve a fair, effective, and humane system of justice." End quote. A beautiful message. Welp, that will be all I have for you today, folks. Thank you once again, deeply, for tuning in. Remember, please excuse my dope-ass swag.